UFP, the United Federation of Podcasts. Good morning. I am Chrissy DeClerc Salagi. And I am Jason Salagi with today's Caffeinated History with the Salagis on the United Federation of Podcasts Network. Before we jump into our topic for the day, we'd like to take a moment to thank our United Federation of Podcasts associate producers, Justin Ozer and David Willett. Without the UFP, we wouldn't be able to bring you this podcast. Listeners, we'd love to add your name to this list, and we can do that with your Patreon subscription to the United Federation of Podcasts of just $10 monthly. Also, don't forget about the Boldly Go Project. Celebrate Gene Roddenberry's centennial by sharing what gives you hope for the next century. Go to boldlygo100.org or use the hashtag boldlygo100 to show what makes you optimistic about the future. Today's topic is Sojourner Truth. Thanks to Justin Ozer for the topic suggestion. Sojourner Truth is one of the great figures in the history of abolition and women's rights. She was born in 1797 to James and Elizabeth Baumfrey, who named her Isabella. The family was enslaved by Johann Hardenberg in Ulster County, New York. This was a primarily Dutch community, and so she grew up speaking Dutch. At age nine, she was sold to John Neely of Kingston, New York, alongside a flock of sheep. This is when she began to learn English. Two years later, she was again sold to Martin Shriver, a tavern keeper in Port Ewer, New York. The last man to claim ownership over her was John Dumont, who purchased her from Shriver in 1810. It was from Dumont's household that she freed herself 16 years later. While being held by Dumont, she was subject to regular beatings by his wife and rapes from him. In 1815, Truth began a relationship with Robert, a slave from a neighboring farm. Robert's owner, Charles Catton Jr., refused to allow them to marry. He did not permit his enslaved men to have any relationships with women outside his ownership because he would not own any children produced. Robert continued to visit until he was caught and beaten severely. They never saw each other again. Her first of five children, James, was born around this time, but died as a child. Her second child, Diana, was fathered by John Dumont. Sometime before 1820, she was married to Thomas, who was also enslaved by Dumont. They had three children, Peter, Elizabeth, and Sophia. We do not know if this marriage was their idea or Dumont's. By the time of Sophia's birth in 1826, Truth was anticipating her freedom under New York's gradual emancipation law, which, on the 4th of July in 1827, was scheduled to free all of those enslaved who were born before 1799. Dumont had promised to manumit her a year earlier, but then refused to do so. Having, in her mind, satisfied her obligations to him, she took her infant daughter out of the Dumont household. She and Sophia were protected by abolitionists Isaac and Maria Van Wanigan, who paid Dumont $20 in order to keep Truth and her daughter until the emancipation went into effect the next summer. They also helped her to sue Dumont over his illegal sale of Truth's eldest son, Peter. She won the suit and regained her son, one of the first black women to win a legal case against a white man in the United States. She moved to New York City in 1829, where she worked as a housekeeper, first for an evangelist minister, Elijah Pearson, and then for the self-proclaimed prophet, Robert Matthews. Her son Peter joined the crew of a whaling ship in 1839, after which they never saw each other again. She received three letters from him, and though she sent letters to him, from his writing it seems he did not receive hers. She became an itinerant preacher in 1843, at which point Isabella Baumfrey became Sojourner Truth to reflect her call to travel and speak God's truths. This vocation led her to various Christian utopian communities in the Northeast, including the Millerites and the Northampton Association of Education and Industry. The latter was an egalitarian community founded by abolitionists who also advocated for women's rights and religious tolerance. While at Northampton, Truth met While at Northampton, Truth met many prominent members of the abolitionist community, including William Lloyd Garrison and Frederick Douglass. Her preaching centered around the abolition of slavery, using her own experiences to illustrate her points. At this time, she also dictated her memoirs to a friend, Olive Gilbert, and these were published by Garrison in 1850. The proceeds from this and her paid speeches allowed her to live independently, purchasing a small home for herself and even paying others' mortgages. In September of 1857, Truth moved to Battle Creek, Michigan to join a group of Seventh-day Adventists and work with abolitionist efforts there. When the Civil War began, Truth was involved in recruitment for Michigan's first colored regiment. Beginning in 1864, she worked with the National Freedmen's Relief Association to assist former slaves. While she was in Washington, D.C. doing this, she made a point of using public transportation whenever she could in order to force the issue of desegregation. 
After the war, she used her connections to advocate for federal land grants to be given to the formerly enslaved, but was unsuccessful. She lent her voice to the re-election campaign of Ulysses S. Grant in 18... She lent her voice to the re-election campaign of Ulysses S. Grant in 1872. Despite her public work on the campaign, she was turned away from the polls in Battle Creek, as Michigan had not yet included women in voting. She continued preaching and speaking on topics of civil rights and women's equality, as well as prison reform and the abolition of capital punishment, until the early 1880s. She died on the 26th of November, 1883, at the age of 86. Sojourner Truth's very nature represented an inherent challenge to both racism and sexism. When she was speaking about the abolition of slavery, the issue of women's rights could not help but be included. And when speaking about women's rights, the issue of civil rights for African Americans was equally incorporated. She is, perhaps, best known for a speech at the Ohio Women's Rights Convention in 1851, in which she cited her own experience to call for both the abolition of slavery and the equality of rights for women. This text strays widely from the version of the speech with which most of us are familiar, in which Truth faces an oppositional crowd and repeats the phrase, Ain't I a woman? to punctuate her points. This version is first seen in an 1863 book, The History of Woman Suffrage, as part of an essay written by Frances Dana Barker Gage. While the overall point of Truth's words remain, they are made to fit a stereotypical view of American blacks at the time. Her words are presented in the dialect of uneducated Southern slaves, and Gage added a comment about Truth having seen her 13 children sold away from her. The author was in attendance at the 1851 meeting, and her own notes from the time are consistent with what was then published. We cannot know why Gage made the changes for the essay 12 years later. Perhaps she thought the point would be better made if Truth met the expectations of readers. In reality, the fact that English was Truth's second language made her very conscious of how she sounded, and she chose her words carefully when speaking to be sure she was understood. Her work and life had been commemorated in many ways over the last century and a half, from poetry to statuary, she was the first black woman to have her statue placed in the American Capitol building, to stamps, and even a Mars rover. Thank you for listening. We'd also like to thank our History with the Zalagis Patreon patrons, Ed Shinever, Laura Dell, Chris Hill, and Susan Capuzzi de Clerk. Their contributions help us to have the time to research and write what you're hearing. We'd appreciate your contribution as well, and you can do that at patreon.com slash history with the Zalagis. And thank you to the creators and executive producers of the UFP Network, Ken Tripp, Tony Robinson, Brandon Shimotala, and Zach Moore. And another thanks to Tony Robinson for the awesome show art, and Zach Tripp for the beautiful closing music. Please subscribe in your favorite podcast app and rate and review us there as well. And while you're at it, you can check out all of the other shows UFP has to offer. We'd love to hear what you think. If you'd like to reach out, you can find the network on Twitter at UFP Earth and this podcast in particular at Zalagi History. That's S-Z-I-L-A-G-Y-I History. You can also talk about any and all of the UFP podcasts in our Facebook group called the Federation Council Chambers. And last but not least, you can find me on Twitter at The Goddess Livia. That's T-A-G-G-O-D-D-E-S-S-L-I-V-I-A. And me at Jason Dark Elf. We'd also love to hear topic suggestions. What would you like to learn on Caffeinated History? This has been a production of MTMR Media Works.